Hello everyone, um, thank you and welcome for, for joining the fifth EA Slash event. It's really good to see many of you actually returned for another event. And if you are new to BA Slash, um, welcome again. And a quick intro of myself, so I'm Monique Cole. I work as a, a management consultant at BA Systems Applied Intelligence. So I'm experienced in um, business analysis, cybersecurity, corporate innovation, um, digital transformation, and all these kind of cool, exciting things. So we also have Alan today, another um, organizing committee of the Slash. So Alan, would you like to introduce yourself quickly as well? Yeah, so um, I've been a BA on and off um, probably since 2000-ish um, um, and probably working in BA type roles even before that, um, predominantly in um, software development. Um, I worked with Naki um, a few years ago and um, brought her in because um, she's got excellent stakeholder management um, skills and I thought uh, it's a really good um, subject to, uh, to get our teeth into. Cool. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Alan. Next slide. So B slash is a community for, for everyone and this is a content focus group. So Alan and I have been exploring ways to actually work with you to bring more useful insights to the community. In the last event, I shared with you the thought of conducting some research on the market and the trends of business analysis. Some of you share with me your top challenge in your role, your concerns in your career path, and suggestions to grow B slash into a bigger, stronger, more sustainable community. So a big thank you to um, Ayura and um, Elizabeth for speaking to me earlier this week. So do, please do um, contact us because I would love to, to organize chats with you to understand more about your journey and how we can build this community further. And as usual, please spread the word with your contacts, um, tweet us, follow us on LinkedIn and on YouTube just to make us visible as well. A few kind of housekeeping points. So you will definitely receive the, the slide back and the um, recording of the, the section in a couple of days. So don't worry. And at the moment, your line is muted because we are doing a recording, but you will become a mute um, to join um, the, the breakout rooms and all these. So you have plenty of opportunities to, to express your, your views or your experience. Um, you, you can your questions in the, the chat chat. Today, actually, we have a, a new arrangement. Um, you will be assigned to a, a breakout room towards the end of the, the main presentation, and you can um, discuss with your group for about eight, ten minutes about how your experience on stakeholder management and engagement. And um, if you can make a note of your discussion and come back to the main presentation and give everyone have a, a quick overview of what has been discussed and also any questions that you may have for Naki to, to elaborate on. Um, final thing, um, you are very welcome to stay behind for our further discussions. So yeah, so looking forward to that as well. It's a great pleasure to have Naki today to share with us her stakeholder management and engagement um, experience in her charity incorporated organization. It is um, an interesting topic because I, I find stakeholder engagement management, when speaking to some of you, you said this is your, your top challenge in your role. But when I ask you about, so what topics of presentation you, you want to see or you want to hear about, you will give me a long list of, um, kind of the hard skills, for example, agile, um, artificial, artificial intelligence, um, safe framework, um, cybersecurity, um, big data, and a, a lot more. So it seems that there's some sort of a mismatch between what is needed to be tackled and what you actually want to learn. Perhaps Naki's presentation today would make us treasure more have constructive discussion and sharing of soft skills as they are actually as important as the hard ones. So without further ado, I'll hand over to, to Naki.
unstable for me, so please forgive me if anything happens. Can everyone see those slides? Yeah, I can. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay. um, so hi everyone, my name is Naki Kadu. Uh, a little bit background about me. I've been a BA what seems like a lifetime now. Um, clearly a vocation that I never realised what is, I, I enjoy being a BA. So I formally trained when I was with Prudential around 2008 and I've worked as a BA ever since and um, met Alan Columbus was it I think we, that's where that? we met yeah uh, so I've worked within the insurance industry and banking industry and I procrastinated about becoming a contractor for many years and I took the leap in 2010 so I've contracted ever since um, so I'm, I'm going to share a little bit about being a BA and how I've transitioned those skill sets into a non-profit community enterprise uh, project and now company organization that I set up in 2018. So that's pretty much what this is going to be about. Um, and it's aptly titled how I manage ministers, chiefs and children. And we still do that today. So DIDA sports organization, we are based between the UK and Uganda, which is in East Africa. I'm sure most of you know where Uganda is. It is, let me just minimize the screen. It's basically, it's a landlocked country in East Africa on the equator. And it's the biggest landlocked country next to Ethiopia and it's bordering Kenya, South Sudan, Rwanda and Tanzania and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, we, I'm Ugandan Irish of, of heritage, so that's, that's the connection with Uganda and the project. And my background and why I did DIDA and why I launched DIDA was really, I've always been a stand for children I've always been a stand for children who are vulnerable in vulnerable communities and obviously as part of you know I've had the privilege of growing up in the UK and being educated in the UK which not a lot of children around the world and certainly within the communities we work with have even you know can even aspire to that so as a Ugandan BA and a passion for sports and youth development we and myself and uh, Giacomo, who's another member of DIDA, um, we launched DIDA in 2018. DIDA is made up of 10 volunteers. We all volunteer our time. None of us are salary based, none of us are staff, but we, there's three of us in the UK and seven in Uganda. So part of this presentation, I'll, I'll talk about our volunteer framework and, and how we adopted that as well as how we really set up DIDA and what stakeholder management and stakeholder engagement means for us and what we, we implemented. You'll see through the uh, presentation, it's not traditional stakeholder management in all maybe what we've experienced in the corporate world, but it should resonate, hopefully with what I share, should resonate with all of us. And we can talk about that in the Q and A of you know, what that looks like for us in our day-to-day -day jobs. Um, depending on what roles you have. DIDA stands for Develop, Inspire, Discipline, Achieve. And these uh, values and objectives came about over a time of eight months of, uh, you know, developing the project initially. And really it's our key objectives and, and our goals and our values really of what we want to grow and instill in the communities that we work with and particularly the children that we work with. Um, obviously our initiative is looking at grassroots development in sports. We initially started looking at football which Ugandans are very passionate about. Probably the biggest Arsenal fan base is in Uganda, <laughs> unbelievably. And um, yeah, so it's always chaotic when Arsenal are playing. But um, we, we felt and we would believe that if you if you start with grassroots in any sort of development, 
um, and sport is always a good way to connect with people within the community and it's a good edu educational tool. So ultimately we want to develop a grassroots and obviously through that you'll inspire the youth to create some discipline and ultimately hopefully with some skills and some training and uh, some, some many programs that we have uh, within that they'll achieve the goals and their aspirations that they want to and they should have and deserve to have in, in the future. So that's ultimately what we're trying to achieve with DIDA. Um, I think we're going to run a poll now, Miss, Mr. Wishart. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of a poll. Here we are. Do I get, do I get to play? Yeah. <laughs> so you should now uh, be seeing a uh, fairly irrelevant poll. <laughs> Irrelevant. Um, I think uh, we're pretty, pretty well versed here in. Uh, yeah, I think so. In stakeholders. Yeah. Awesome. So let's have a look at these results. Bit of humour, all of the above. Could be, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely, we definitely could have vampires on the raft. You never know. <laughs> So yeah, pretty much anyone who has the interest or influence to impact your product team or project, I think that's uh, a clear winner. Yeah, so we're all well versed. So we we're on, we understand. We speak the same language, hopefully. Yeah. Shall I just close that on screen? Uh, yeah, um, hopefully that is, I've closed it down, so it should. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, that should be going well, hopefully. Okay, shall I move on? Yep. So, okay. As we know, because the poll has just told me, you, you already really know this, but um, I'm going to touch on it because it, it's relevant to, to Dida and the conversation I want to have. But as we know, broadly, Stakeholder management can be described as a systematic identification, analysis, planning and implementation of actions, which ultimately become project plans uh, and which are designed to engage with stakeholders at different, different um, aspects of the project, different times of the project. Um, stakeholder engagement following from that is the practice of influencing in a variety of outcomes, which I'll, I'll kind of touch on and how that's relevant and what we did for DIDA and what we continue to do and assess for DIDA um, through the, you know, what we'll, the practice of those outcomes through consultation, uh, communication, depends on what type of communication, what, what organisations you work in, a lot of negotiation and compromise as we'll all be aware of, um, can be political and that's where the negotiation I think comes in. Um, I've been reading uh, Henry Kissinger, which I think is the negotiator, which I think is quite an interesting book to read if you're a BA and you're in that position of stakeholder management. It's a handy book to have, interesting as well. Um, yeah, so why is stakeholder management important? Um, obviously, as we know, it identifies and documents the approach you want to take in order to increase support. Um, and minimise negative impacts of stakeholders. And I'll come on to this and the importance of this for DIDA as a non-profit and particularly being a bi-location, bi-located organisation. Um, it should identify the key stakeholders along with their level of power um, and authority. So I'll put authority in, in brackets because while someone might be in a position of power, they may not be authorised. And, and I've come across that a little bit in, in DIDA and I'll try and touch on that later. And it should also identify and prioritise the appropriate format of engagement. And I say appropriate um, because that's relevant for DIDA in terms of how we have to sensitise the information and who we're giving that information to. Could be the same for some of the projects that you work in. Um, it's always important as BAs to, I believe, be aware and confident that your advocates 
um, for both stakeholders, both sponsors and both users, end users and customers. So they're all, you know, broadly, you're, you're, you're the key for everybody, in my opinion. And you should advocate that role and you should be confident in that role and feel empowered to, to really appropriately engage and manage your stakeholders, you know, as, as best as you can. Um, so from a DIDA perspective, I'm just going to move certain things around because I can't see. So we, this model, uh, we sort of assess this regularly and we follow this cycle of assessment on a regular basis. Every time we're either doing an event or setting up a new project or setting up a new, a new activity or a new initiative. So we'll always follow this, this cycle of, of assessment. So ultimately as an organization, when I had decided with Giacomo and the team to incorporate DIDA, so we officially incorporated in November, 2018, and we're as a legal entity. So we needed to seek uh, official endorsement, if you like, at country level and using my network. And Dida had to register as a member of the Uganda UK Health Alliance, which is a, an initiative uh, and a program, a, a cross pollination program between doctors and nurses. And that's with the public health in England, NHS and Uganda. Um, I think it's a, glo it's a global program. I think it's Singapore as well. So because we're dealing with sports, we are engaging with communities and it's seen as health and well-being. We needed to register as uh, members of Uganda UK Health Alliance. And through that, we were helped to identify some key stakeholders. We analysed the level of those stakeholders and the category of those stakeholders and what sort of information and how we needed to engage them where they would be based, whether that's UK, whether that's in Uganda, the timeliness of, of engagement and the priority and obviously the impact that those stakeholders would have on DIDA uh, being allowed to even operate in the country. So we then identified how we wanted to engage with those stakeholders, whether that was meeting, you know, the Ugandan High Commissioner or state entity uh, stakeholders to seek endorsement and memorandums of understanding because we're a foreign organization and we're working with minors. So we will be monitored and assessed, I'm sure, in, in, as time progresses. And obviously as part of that cycle of assessment, we'll communicate with these stakeholders and different category of stakeholders as often as is necessary and is as planned. Um, so categories of our stakeholders really, as I just briefly touched on, state entities, officials. So we align to Ministry of Sport and Education in Uganda and we align to Ministry of Youth and Gender Equality. So we, we met with the Minister of Youth um, as opposed to Sport because Minister of Sport and Education is the wife of the President. So we couldn't really access her, but she is aware of us and her permanent secretary is aware of our um, activities, but really our key stakeholder in country at, a, at a state entity level would be Minister of Youth. And so we, we have broadly, we, we keep her informed um, when we're in country or when I'm in country. District officials, because we are based in the Eastern district of Uganda, uh, a district called Dhaka, we will engage and have engaged with the likes of district educational officials because we're working with schools. Community leaders are key for us because you'll have community elders, you'll have uh, kingdom leaders, so you'll have clan leaders um, that you have to engage and keep informed because you are operating in their kingdom, so Uganda is made up of clans and tribes if you like. Um, and because we are, we are based in the kingdom of the Bugisu, the Soga, we had to um, en engage those community leaders and seek their endorsement. And if, you know, the, the danger was and the challenge was if they didn't really respect what we were doing, the community would take their lead and, and take their, their um, response. 
our, our stakeholders are obviously the parents because we work with children. We work with ages of four to 14. We work with teachers, head teachers, because we work with five schools at the moment. Children, of course, we've got about 250 children in the Chess in School program, vast. Um, we actually launched the Chess Initiative in April 2019, expecting about 190 children to, to come on board because they'd never seen Chess before and 800 turned up. So that was an engagement. We didn't really plan that engagement very well, but that was a, you know, was a learning, learning curve for us. Volunteer, obviously, another group is our volunteers, and we're always seeking volunteers, both in the UK uh, and Uganda. The media, of course, so on-ground media is absolutely crucial in Uganda um, because we are a foreign organisation. We're considered a foreign organisation. Donors, sponsors, key for us. And one that I did forget to put on here was our partners. Um, you know, the likes of the Chess, Song Chess Academy, who we work with to deliver the Chess in Schools program. Um, my clicking's not working. How we identified our stakeholders, as I mentioned, was I used, I have a, gratefully, I have a big and a wide professional network, obviously being a BA, you know, um, I've developed that network and I've made sure to maintain that network, which I think is really important whether you're in a job with those colleagues or not, I think it's still really important to maintain your relationships with your professional network, whether that's even looking for a job or not. Clearly something like Dida, you never know how, you know, a person you may have worked with like Alan, how long ago, nearly 10 years ago, would cross paths. Um, so it's always useful to, to maintain those relationships and that's all part of stakeholder management. And obviously our social network and, and the volunteers network in Uganda. What was new for me and obviously something that I hadn't really experienced before was community sensitization and I've touched on that I think already but whilst I might be of Ugandan heritage I'm not a relatable member you, you know for me to go out to the community and deliver uh, an objective of DIDA it wouldn't be received because I'm, I'm not relatable. I stuck the way I speak, the way I look, I don't speak the language. And so, and, and most of the community we work with don't have access to technology. So we have to engage them on ground. We have to engage them either through community meetings and have their leaders provide some input to those meetings. So they don't all have access to telephones. They don't all have access to TVs, radios, or even have power in their homes. So and they don't, not all of them read, unfortunately. So we had to be able to engage them at a level of understanding whereby we'd still be able to get their buy-in. And that is a constant for us. So that's something we always have to make sure we are sensitive to and because we're working with minors. So we just have, that's something that was quite overwhelming for me because it, it kind of made or break Dida and it's always something that if the community doesn't embrace what you're doing and ultimately understands what the, the strategy is or what your your vision is trying to do which is develop a community so they have some sustainability and that they can empower themselves if they don't really appreciate that or or respect it or care it's very hard to then progress as, a, as an NGO or as a non-profit I, I, I think anyway be interested to hear other people's opinion um, so some of the artifacts and I'm trying to click I don't know why it's not working so initially obviously most data analysis or data projects or any project really we did some I think about eight months six months worth of data gathering and demographics of Uganda the population of Uganda uh, the population of the area and the district that we work to work in and the challenges. Um, we were given some data from Uganda UK Health Alliance uh, so that we could align to some KPIs. That helped us uh, generate and define our initial project proposal, which we pitched and we presented to some peers, which gave us some, you know, the sort of go ahead that it was a viable project and it had, uh, it had a viable business model around it. 
we then generated and we still have a you know we have a business plan that's fairly fluid but we have we have our strategy set for each of the sports initiatives um once we create our illegal entity we obviously have to you know you set up your online presence etc uh, and so forth so we have business brochures corporate brochures that we had to define we generate official letters as and when we need to meet our stakeholders both at a state entity and of course we had to i'd never actually come across having to develop an mou before um, and obviously when i met the uganda um, embassy it was quite daunting because you just you don't know how they're going to receive you and i felt quite corporate and you know very you know ba like um but you're at state entity at country level it's just a completely different etiquette it's a completely different protocol um just how you have to operate and how you have to deal with each you know there's layers of people that you have to talk to and with respect and if you're not showing that respect it's it's very bureaucratic but um you have to follow that and respect what what you're being asked to do um so some tools you would have seen this very basic um was a heat map and i I was conscious that our volunteers who between the between the ages of 23 and 35 um, all graduates in their own field, but not corporate, not uh, trained in the way we are. Um, they're not BAs, they're not project managers. However, they may have the skill sets and that we would be able to identify that would make them good BAs or would make them good PMs and so forth. So this was just a little tool that they could understand and, and visually manage themselves, bearing in mind not all of the volunteers either also have access to laptops, smartphones, etc. So it was just something that they could just do on paper as well. Um, but it was for me, I tried to explain the importance of engaging and identifying stakeholders and how they manage and monitor their relationship with that stakeholder because I'm not always on ground. So I'd like to empower them to be able to manage the stakeholders on ground and feel empowered to do that. So this was, I found this was a really easy tool for them to grasp quite quickly. Um, yeah, so that's just something I wanted to share. Um, yeah, so stakeholder engagement strategy at a high level, it should be informed by your stakeholder management strategy. I don't know what your experience is as a BA, but sometimes, obviously in projects, you may be given a lot of information, you may not be given a lot of information, you may have lots of requirements that you have to decipher, or you may have none at all, and it's completely ambiguous, and you don't, you've, you've got no strategy. And so I'd be interested to learn how you kind of manage that and how you've approached that to help your engagement strategy as a BA and you know I think we should always set our own strategy as a BA and we should manage how we believe is the best way in the best interest of the project to engage your stakeholders it should um, you know your strategy should define what your outcomes should be so for us it would be getting to getting buying getting registration on the chess program is an outcome for us and therefore we know we've engaged with the community well because we had a good set, we had a good uh, turnout um, outcomes for each project. So obviously, as BA deliverables, potentially depends on, on what your experience. It should also help you define the content format relatable to each stakeholder category. So for us, it's relatable to state entity. Is it relatable to the children? Um, will they engage? Will the teachers care? You know, will the teachers understand what we're trying to achieve, etc. Hence why we're using sports as an engagement tool. Um, and it should help you with planning. And it should always loop back to your key objectives and your key requirements in the first place anyway. So for DIDA, as you'll see in the picture, we have lots and lots of community meetings. Um, and pe people, this, you know, the culture in Uganda is community based. So that's, that's the culture. Um, and therefore that's the best way to engage them because community based they, they're a community Just not uh, london's a little bit different so but anyway dida is uh we're bilocated um so part of the team is in the uk we can't always be on ground 
Um, we knew we needed to define our roadmap and what we wanted to do on a monthly basis and how we wanted to engage. And we knew we needed to be smart about what messages we wanted to and what outcomes we wanted to have for each of those months or the quarters, if you like. We knew we wanted to launch 2019, January. We knew we needed to engage with the ministry before we launched politically. We had to be seen to do that in country because we couldn't, it wasn't the right thing to have done to launch with the community and then the ministry find out that we're in country and we haven't told her. So probably that could have, we could have got into a lot of trouble, I think, if we hadn't done that. Um, obviously, with this year and uh, COVID, the asterisk there is we're, we're going to have to revise and rethink our strategy and our engagement plan because of the restrictions uh, in country. So we now need to rethink how we want to engage and teach and educate the children because we've got 250 five schools and we have to social distance as an example. So we need to consider how as an organisation we can take leadership in that within the community. Um, we had to set out our engagement plan whether that was community meetings, campaign um, on Twitter or a football match or, you know, a chess tournament or whatever that might look like, we needed to set that out. Or, you know, if there was other campaigns going on in the world, for example, Autism Day, we had a campaign and engagement for that. Um, so there's education and awareness that we had to do, much like a marketing and comms plan, to be fair pretty much the same, I, it, I, my view. Um, we also needed to identify a local team to implement that engagement plan because we couldn't do that from here. And that's where we came up with the volunteer structure and an onboarding process was implemented. So we have a volunteer handbook and we always do call, call outs every, every quarter, every month, depending on what, on what we need, whether it's for an event, we try and resource for that accordingly. And there's a process of applications and so forth. And um, the reason we did that is because we had to, because we're working with minors, we had to develop a code of conduct um, and, and, and develop a, a governance around the volunteer structure. So, you know, our, our children are from four years old to 14. They're in a vulnerable community. They're in a, a naive community. We didn't want volunteers who would be drinking on site or, you know, so we had to develop a code of conduct. This, this, when I introduced this to the volunteers, they'd never seen anything like it. They were they were almost confused as to why I was even asking them, you know, why, you know, not you have to wear a uniform, you have to conduct yourself in a professional way. And they were they were just thinking it was going to be a fun day out, but you know, you still have to operate professionally. Um, part of our demographic analysis, we learnt that Uganda 78 of the population in Uganda is under 30. Um, and so mostly, as we'll appreciate, um, the, if the most effective form of engagement and communication we have found is social media and community events. Because every Uganda has a culture of, you know, they're fun, they're very laid back. They, it's known as, you know, people from Rwanda go to Uganda for the weekend to have a party because it's just a very young and dynamic uh, population and culture. So, and most people in the city, in the capital, will use Twitter and they're always on Twitter. So that was a form of engagement for us that we identified quite quickly. We onboarded a couple of influencers to help us push the brand quite early on. Um, and of course, we identified the fact that community sensitization was key for us. So we always, every month, we have to assess who we're going to meet, what are we going to talk about, uh, when do we think we need to do that if we're having, let's say, we do an annual DIDA Women's Cup every March and pre because the, or the community we work in is predominantly Muslim and generally, you know, in, in Africa and not just exclusive to Uganda, the girl child is not supported in sport. So it's, it's not seen as a, that parents won't promote or allow girls to play sport. So we, we've come up with this initiative to um, create awareness on International Women's Day, I think which is the 8th of March, to push and highlight awareness of girls' access to sports and create awareness about it. So we always hold an event just for girls and it's a football event just for girls. So we're, hopefully that becomes a proper club event 
Dida Cup becomes the cup for the year, we hope. Um, and our engagement strategies obviously has oversight with the Dida leadership team. So it's myself and the, the two gents in the UK, that's Fella and Giacomo. Um, and of course, what's important for our engagement strategy is the content, the format, and who, for each category. So like I said, with a community um, event, I wouldn't go out with lots of um, spreadsheets or, or, or um, PowerPoint slides, but we might do flyers. We might engage the community through flyers and pictorial images and just, you know, to, to gain, gauge their interest and things like that. And then we'll have a discussion and then we'll, you know, we'll put something on the radio and we'll get the local radio station to, to kind of create some awareness. So there's, there's different formats of, of engagement for us. But broadly, that, that's, this is just touching the surface for us. So any questions afterwards, by all means, do ask. Um, and I think that's me, really. Hopefully I've talked, I haven't talked to you all to death, but there's a couple of questions. Do you want to do this, Monique, or do you want me to? Do that. So um, I just sent the, the instructions to, to everyone in the, the chat box. So yeah, so um, as um, shown on the slide, Nappy, if you can show all the, the, the questions there. So um, we will yeah. break ourselves into have a, a number of breakout rooms and then you can join um, that room and then to discuss um, any of the, the following. So for example, like how, what, what sort of things have you been doing for stakeholder management engagement? Is that kind of different from um, Naki's experience or how anything kind of similar that you pick out? And also kind of, would you kind of maybe share your thoughts on, oh, if I, um, I am in, in um, theater, how would I do differently in terms of managing my, my stakeholders? So it would be good to, to get your views. And then um, anything kind of, further that you would like uh, Natty to, to elaborate on based on her, her sharing. So um, so we'll have eight minutes to do the discussions in the breakout rooms and then we'll invite you back and each group I'll give you kind of one and a half minutes, two minutes to present back kind of a summary of what you have discussed with your IoT. Is that all good? Okay, so I'm just going to yeah. and uh, we're going to have three rooms and um, hopefully that will uh, give us enough to uh, create some discussion. Yeah. Yeah, I think everyone is, is back now. Um, so I think what, um, what we're trying to do is just run through each, um, each room. So, um, Naki, um, if we can start with your room first. Um, either you or, or one of your um, code breakout room attendees can uh, run through things, that'd be great. Dan, do you want to add anything? I'm um, happy to give some notes. Um, I think probably the one thing just sort of extending from our from your talk was, uh, I think the, the bit of the takeaway was, I think the, the difference in uh, approach, depending on the context of where you're in, in terms of how you sort of manage stakeholders, I think the comparison I took from just working here with a very sort of defined, maybe sort of standard project where you have defined parameters, you're working with a certain uh, sort of known set of people within an organization. Um, I think the, the example that you, you mentioned, there's, I think there's a lot of complexity in terms of how you un, have to understand um, kind of the unwritten rules and some of the, some of the um, sort of other considerations of how to operate effectively. I think that was, the, that was one of the very interesting things to actually get things done. Depending on the context of where you're operating, there are certain rules that you need to adopt. I think that was the, one of the key, the really interesting things. That Um, it wasn't something we discussed specifically, it was just something that's occurred to me. I think when you're kind of identifying stakeholders, you've got to know where to draw the line. Um, I mean, you can, you can find as many um, stakeholders to a particular project, almost as, ma uh, as many uh, individuals that work in that organisation. So, you know, you've got, to, you've got to kind of know where you're drawing the line and know who to, who to actually engage. and um, 
not so much who to, to ignore, but, you know, not so, you know, not engaged so actively. Um, I, I think that the, um, you know, the approach that you take to stakeholders also um, gets determined by the uh, kind of project methodology that you, uh, you adopt. Uh, so, for example, Agile, uh, you know, in software, de um, you know, delivery, um, you know, one of your major um, engagement mechanisms um, is your show and tell, your demonstration at the end of a sprint where you're showing everybody this is this is what we've done in the last sprint. Here's what's working here. Here are, the, you know, the issues that we faced and all that kind of lovely stuff. Um, also, you know, with the main sort of stakeholder, usually the product owner or whoever they may, um, you know, use to proxy for them. And, and, you know, nine times out of 10, it may be a team of uh, BAs, they're engaged, you know, right throughout the whole project. So they know exactly what's happening as and when it's happening. So there's no need to do things like, you know, do presentations or reports or what have you to them. Um, where it does become a bit of a gray area is where, you know, senior management have, uh, you know, got a little bit of a vested interest in, in, in what's happening, particularly if you're, you know, engaged in some kind of greenfield uh, project. Um, that's where sort of issues arise because Agile doesn't really lend itself to uh, so-called written reports or what have you. Um, it, it, it kind of re relies on that direct engagement, but, um, you know, there are ways of dealing with that, especially um, you know the way the way that um, you, you you can manage your uh, product owner in terms of how they engage with the rest of the stakeholders and what information they decide to come back. Sorry, I didn't mean to kind of hog um, hog the floor for, for for so long. But no, that's great. I think there's some really good points in. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I've always thought is that the product manager can be your friend. Most <laughs> definitely. Oh. Uh, and they could be your enemy. Um. That, that's true. <laughs> okay, so uh, if we can move on to Anne, uh, who is in the final breakout room, and perhaps she can give us a, uh, a summary of, uh, of what they, they talked about. Well, funny enough, we had the same thoughts as um, <laughs> the other group, you know, but our experiences are in standard um, projects or organisations already set up. Um, you know, very often you know who you're going to be dealing with, whether it's a brand new project in that organisation or a business as usual, you know, small changes going through. Um, interesting to see what it's like to set up a whole new organisation and the approach taken, whereas it's like one engagement plan. Whereas like, I think our experience has been um, we would have a stakeholder management plan, stakeholder management engagement, and we'd have a change management and because not always using the same people for your change management um, activities as you would for your stakeholder, you know, engagement and sign off and things like that. So very similar really in that way. Um, that was it really. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, I hope everyone found those uh, those sessions interesting. Certainly, it's I think it's nice to uh, you know to have that opportunity to talk to people that are outside of uh, our or our organisations and you know just see different viewpoints. I think uh, seeing Naki and the experiences that she had um, you know, with a, a very different organisation and a very different um, political system. Uh, has opened my eyes. Uh, I hope uh, everyone found this very useful. I'm going to now um, close off. Our next presentation will be on the 17th of um, September and it's all around service design and business analysis um, where um, you know, we'll, we'll get the links up onto Eventbrite and um, you know, just register from there. Um, otherwise, uh, I'll say um, plea for anyone who wants to um, look into helping us organise these, um, whether you've got some uh, suggestions on how we can 
grow and engage with the community and maybe we need to um, pick Naki's brains uh, to help us with our stakeholder management. Um, whether you've got some topics that you'd like us to cover or if you're an expert and you're willing to speak on a topic, you know, email myself or Monique uh, or just send us uh, you know, a tweet uh, to be slash or drop something on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn. Um, we've uh, got our normal uh, channels, our at BA slash uh, on Twitter, our, li our LinkedIn page. Um, we'll get this um, recording processed and pushed up to our YouTube channel so uh, you can review it. Certainly the main presentation will be there. Um, and again, thank you very much for attending. Naki, thank you for all your time and effort. Uh, putting together what was a, a subject that I think we all know is important, but tends to uh, get forgotten in, uh, in our rush to write stories or uh, put um, you know, acceptance criteria down. So we're gonna finish off now. If anyone wants to stay behind and chat to any of us, um, turn on your video, turn on uh, your uh, mic, and uh, other than that, have a great evening and uh, hopefully we'll see you at another one of these events. So thank you, very much. thank you, Naki. Thank you everyone for giving up your Wednesday evening. Thank uh, you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, let's hope we can uh, carry on this community and uh, keep chatting.